Rolling into our next bargains and negotiations for starters here. So, chapter 7, video 3. All right, so what are these seven rules for negotiating that? Let's kind of list those out. It'd be good for you to put those in your notes if you don't have your stuff in front of you. These are pretty good ones, and I'm going to add a few more. I already added one, or it's kind of minor, kind of a modification to some of his good ones. So, so seven rules for negotiating. Some of them were in this video, some of them were in the previous two. So number one, you can take them in any order if you want. What did you learn about negotiating? That's one of those tips. Always tell the truth, yes. So always tell the truth. Now, I, uh, Russ's modification to that, or addendum, I should say, it's not, not changing it, but I'm just adding to it, what an addendum means in contract law. What did I suggest on Monday? I think it was Monday, maybe it was Tuesday. I guess it was Tuesday. We didn't meet. We didn't meet. Anybody remember? I'm hoping it will leave a lasting impression on you for deal making in the future. What's that? Imply. imply. Good. So what was the first part? That was the last part. Don't lie. Imply. Right? So don't lie. Imply. Kind of follows along with this. I'm just giving you a uh, a modifier, an add-on um, that you can be creative because in situations where you uh, might be tempted to try to strengthen your position by telling a little lie, just, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. Everybody does it when they're negotiating. No, no, you don't have to. You really don't. You can imply something to them. You don't have to lie. Start to be creative. Tell yourself, I'm not going to lie during negotiations. And when you go to a negotiation, like I, I suggest, uh, for how many people, we're, the next video is going to talk about places to go for deals, but how, how many people like garage sales? Garage sales, yard sales, sometimes depending on what state you live in. Oh man, those are fun. You can find really good deals at garage sales. And uh, maybe more importantly, it's a great place to work, uh, work on your negotiation skills. And so again, you might sometimes accidentally lie. So I've caught myself lots of times as I was working on this, uh, mastering my negotiation skills over the last 30 years plus. And uh, all of a sudden it's like, oh, why did I just say, right? You're kind of in the heat of the moment. You said something like, I'm trying to strengthen my position. Like, I don't have, I, I mentioned the one before, like, I don't have the money, or um, I'd have to go home and ask my wife first or something. Uh, and, and that's uh, not true. Right? You, can, you can pull the trigger right now, but I'd have to go ask my wife. You can probably come up with other ways to imply that. You could say, well, I'm not sure my wife's going to like this one, right? If you're buying something, and she's questioning your purchases, you're kind of saying, I've got this wife barrier that I have to deal with. Instead of saying, I have to ask my wife permission, or I have to check with my wife, which might be a lie to strengthen your position, you might just say, oh, uh, yeah, my wife might not like this one, you know, or something along those lines. So you can imply lots of different things uh, without having to do those little, little lying uh, cheats. All right, number two. Be patient. So be patient. I guess I could throw the B on here. Be patient. <laughs> so this brings me to, um, well, no, that's not too well. It could fall into this one. Um, but uh, waiting it out, uh, you guys talked about uh, not jumping on the car right away, right? Being patient for the deal to come together and not try to close on it too soon. So that kind of falls into one of our other tips that we'll come to. What's number three? What's that? Cash. So cash is powerful. It's unusual in today's world, today's classic world, today's Bitcoin world, today's you know everything. Um, and I think you can really use it to your advantage um, in most cases. 
um, that, oh, this guy is weird. He's got, and that's what I found because I've been a cash guy now for a long time. And uh, in fact, it does kind of backfire sometimes. So I went to Freddy's uh, frozen custard for uh, lunch yesterday. And I, I pulled out a hundred dollar bill because that's what I had in my envelope that I had for using it. So I pulled out and I, I had my blow category because I was treating uh, my guys to lunch. And so in my blow is what I wanted to use and the bill came to $40 and something cents. So I pulled out a hundred dollar bill to pay for it because I didn't have any other change that way. And the kid behind the cash register, you know, 16, 17 or whatever, it's not his fault, but it was, we were kind of early for lunch. And so how many $20 bills do you think they had in the cash register? Nah, so he started bringing out this wad of fives. And I'm like, oh gosh, okay, hold on, I think I got it. So then I, I reached into my uh, house category and I had $41, right? So I took it out of the house category, but again, I knew what I was doing, right? And I'm going to then replace the $40 back into the blow category. But using the envelope system, kind of mentally allows you to do those things without thinking you're spending your electric bill or you're spending your rent bill, right? Back to the things that we were talking about uh, earlier. So we're able to do that. So I found cash to be really fun and, and uh, not everybody's comfortable with cash. So again, this is personal finance. It's just a, a tip and an option for you to think about. Number four, shut up. That's what he started this one up with. So shut up. Okay, so I'm going to put a little Rust modifier uh, addendum to this. Um, he or she, but I learned he because it came from my mentor, boss, multimillionaire negotiator. He who speaks first loses. He who speaks first loses. So. Uh, Ev, Ev Cochran taught me that early on. He's like, Russ, when you get into negotiations, just remember, he who speaks first loses. I'm like, who speaks first loses? What does that even mean? You know, I, don't, I didn't really get how that would apply to the negotiation, right? And so um, then I started negotiating stuff. And here's what you're going to find if you get into uh, negotiations. Um, if the other person is truly negotiating and not just caving on your first offer, which a lot of times they cave on the first offer, but um, if you're actually negotiating, you'll come to a point where you're talking about stuff and you're jibber jabbering back and forth, and then there'll be this little bit of silence. And it's kind of that awkward silence. And then you learn he who speaks first loses. Because the first person to speak is going to be the one that concedes their position, right? It's like, they want 30 bucks, I want to pay 20 bucks or whatever. And then we get to this awkward silence and then don't be the first person to speak. Ride it out, which is the same thing as shut up, right? But you'll kind of come to that point in the negotiation and it's kind of fun uh, to just kind of wait it out. Um, it might be you if you're really on the other side. One funny story I have with this is, uh, uh, a guy that um, we did uh, business dealings with and, and um, had a couple joint ventures with, him and I were negotiating over some uh, duplexes. I think we had some uh, dispute on something or other. And so we're trying to negotiate uh, the final deal price on a duplex. And then, so he's sitting across from my desk at the office. I can remember this plain as day. And uh, we come to this point in the negotiation where I'm silent, you know, we kind of came to that awkward silence. And we both just sat there. And we both sat there for like 45 seconds or a minute. I can't remember how long. It seemed like an eternity. And then he finally says, Ev taught you he just speaks first loses too. Huh? And so he knew the same guy that told me the negotiation technique. And so then we both burst out laughing. And I can't remember where we ended up. We probably were somewhere, somewhere, made something to figure out. But uh, we were both using the same technique. And it, it got really long. And we had a good laugh about it. Okay, so uh, number five. What is it? Walk away, yes. So we talked about that one uh, on Tuesday. So this is a pretty easy one. I think uh, at least daily. How many people have used walk away? I don't remember daily you used it, right? Did anybody else use walk away power? Family? So that's an easy one, really. Um, it's kind of a 
It's kind of similar to shut up in a way. Like first you probably shut up, and then it's like, um, oh, sorry, you know, we couldn't come to terms, and then you walk away. So you can kind of do these in combination. It's kind of similar. You're really just letting it sit for a night or two nights, or or maybe you're just walking away completely. All right, number six. Who's got number six? Julio. That isn't good enough. That is not, we'll do a little apostrophe, isn't good enough. Now, this is one that I haven't used too much, but I've used all of these a little bit. Um, again, if you're, uh, you can kind of come up with your own wording, of course, like, oh, well, that's not going to work. Uh, you know, can you, and then you can start uh, maybe throwing in some other things or something to try to sweeten the pot. But really, the, the moral of it is, is to let them bring something else to the table. Right? To let yourself say, that isn't good enough, then shut up, right? And then see what they see what else they bring to the table. So that's kind of a, a nice way to get people moving. And number seven. Last one. This one is kind of a, a little bit different one. I, I don't use this one as, as often, but it, it's uh, I, I use something similar to it. What was that last one? Very last one he talked about with the bass boat. The takeaway thing. So if I take away, so let's just call it the takeaway. If I take away the bass boat, so basically he bundled a couple of things together. And you this would be kind of a garage sale technique too, or something, is to is to say you want, you've got the three goods that add up to 50 bucks that you want. And then there's this other thing over there that, um, you know, it might be kind of nice. Well, uh, how about 50 bucks for all four of these things? And then they're like, oh, well, uh, no, I can't, I can't let that go for, the, for with it. And then you're like, oh, well, if you take away that item, then we're going to have to maybe do like, 30 or 40, as if you had that part of the pitch, right? So you, it's kind of a little bit of a, a, a casting a little smoke in there on the bundle of what you're negotiating. And then sometimes that might have more meaning for that person. And the way he characterized it was if, if it was a basketball or something that they held near and dear, uh, then he, he didn't really want it anyway. But, oh, if you're going to take that away from the deal, then, you know, you're going to have to come stronger on price. Okay, so that's the, that's the seven. Um, so then number eight that Russ is going to add that I think you can find useful takes maybe a little, a little getting used to, but meet in the middle bias. Meet in the middle bias. And so what Russ's tip is, is change the middle. So what I've learned after hundreds of negotiations, whether it be real estate or garage sales or anything, is that if you're trying to avoid contract, uh, contact, uh, conflict, um, people tend to say, ah, how about if we meet in the middle? Right? It's a fair thing to do. So um, you offer $60 on something, and they're asking $100. And so, hey, how about if we meet in the middle at 80 right, or something like that? And so what I've learned over time is that you can kind of slightly change the middle, and it usually comes down to whatever end of the deal you're on, if you're on the buyer side or the seller side, you do it by uh, not changing very much. So let me give you an example. If you were the seller of this $100 item, somebody offers you 60, and you say, oh, wow, no, I don't think I could do, do 60, but you know, maybe, maybe 90 would work. And then they're thinking already that they're wanting to meet in the middle. And so they give you that middle. And then you say, well, no, um, that's not quite the middle for me. By making, by changing down a little bit, even though you were willing to take 80 or 70 or something, by coming down just a little bit off your price, your new middle is now closer to your side of the deal rather than the other side. And you can do the flip side with a buying deal. Um, if they say, 60 and, and uh, the guy comes back and says, well, how about we meet in the middle at 80? It's like, oh, I, you know, I can't do that. Um, but how about if we, you know, 
uh, I think 70 would be about right or something. So you can kind of change the middle and you just kind of do it by um, usually not being too aggressive with your counter offer back after the first time. You just drop by a little bit that says, hey, you know, my price is good. I'm willing to negotiate. So one of the things that I always told my, my clients in, in real estate is to, to not, um, not do anything. So don't, like if somebody lowballs you, let's say $60 seemed like a low ball on a $60,000 on a $100,000 house or something. You know, like, we're just saying no to that. You know, that's, that's, a, that's expensive to me, right? And then I try to coach them like, oh, chill out. You know, sometimes people just do this and, and you'd be surprised. So let's just give them a little bit of a counter off the back. Maybe you, drive, you take 95, right? I mean, you're trying to get 85 or something. Just give them a little bit of a signal back that you're willing to negotiate. And so then sometimes you throw 95 back and then they go from 60 to, well, we can do 85. And all of a sudden they're jumping right back into the game. And now, oh, 85 and 95, how about if we meet in the middle at 92 and you were actually going to take 85, right? So all these kind of little nuances, it takes practice. And um, that's where I think uh, having these little, little times for sales and stuff really works out. All right, do you guys have any negotiating te techniques or tips that are maybe related or anything to that? Was this eye-opening for you on kind of learning some negotiating techniques? Let me see a show of hands. Was this eye-opening, learning some of this stuff? Okay, good. And usually you pick up, like I picked up some, you know, when I watched some videos the first time from, from Dave that I didn't know to do. And so, yeah, you kind of come up with what you're comfortable with. That's the most important thing. You want to go into a negotiation being kind of comfortable and happy. Like nobody likes negotiating with a jerk. I mean, and you just kind of have to take this, you know, and it's like, oh, well, that's, you know, I don't even want to deal with you, right? Um, so you kind of come up with what you're comfortable with. Some techniques might work better for you than others, and just give it a try and see if you can find some deals. All right. Um, so let's uh, get into our double discount mode here. So, yeah. Do our exercise. So I need you guys to get into groups of minimum of three, maximum of four. We've got a double discount. <laughs> three, six, nine, twelve. Okay. All right. Go ahead, shuffle around, shovel up. Really circle around too. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to work together on this one. There's a lot of calculations. You can pull out your calculator. Uh, or your phone rather, and use it as a calculator if you want to throw it on airplane mode. I'll put you in groups. If you need to be in groups, I'll let you self-select for now, but a minimum of three, maximum of four. So look around the room, look for somebody that looks like minimum of three, maximum of four. I will shuffle the groups as needed if you can't find a group. <laughs> so what do we got? You guys, you three. Do you want to flip the back to Tammy? And are you three going? All right, why don't you have a circle around this table here so you guys can cuddle up and three So this is like Kohl's or something, right? We've got Kohl's double discount. So along the top, you've got the original price of $29.99. The sale price is 15%. That means you're going to get $4.50 off. So the sale price after the discount is $25.49. Then, wait, there's more, an additional 20% off at the register, right? So that 
5, 20% is off of the sale price. So you're getting a double discount. And that means your new price, after you subtract the 510 from the 2549 is $20.39. And then your savings is now your new price compared to your old price. How much did you save? You had a 32% savings. So the, you can look at your total amount of savings and calculate the savings off. So now you're gonna go through and fill that out for the rest of them. You can talk amongst yourselves. And then there are questions here, and then the flip side has questions too. So one thing you guys might want to do is kind of create a dollar saved column. So if you look at what did I end with, right, after all the cash register, double discount, blah, 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 really in this price, Minus this price is the dollars saved, the actual amount of dollars saved. And then this dollar savings off is the dollars saved, this number divided by the original price. Can you say that again? Yeah. So you've got dollars saved was $29.29 minus what I actually paid after all the discounts gave me about, let's call it, you know, $9 ish. So $9 divided by the original price is going to give you the 32%. And there's a couple other ways to mathematically do it, but I think that's the one that makes the most sense. Is that what you guys are doing? Okay, yeah, you can't get it a different way, but that's one way to do it. That's kind of, then you kind of see how many dollars you're actually saving. So you kind of create a column here of dollar saved. Why are we Yeah, 
Yeah, one seventy nine minus this number, and then divided by that. Go ahead and do it on your second and see if it comes out. So I think you're right. But in here, you can do you know one eighty minus one Okay, so it's not handled the size of 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 the size and you're right, there is another way to take like the, first, like, yeah. and let's like, say this way, you're trying to say, so take the 45 plus 20% of the, uh, the other discount that you got, and then divide that by 179, that's going to be your answer. So there's two ways to just kind of add them up. But 40, 60, 44, yeah, there's a factor partner. <laughs> well, no, I want to work with you then. Let's get it. So, how much money? How much money in number two is totally being saved? Okay, seventy-two. So, right, seventy-two. So, say that's seventy-two dollars. Correct. Seventy-two divided by one eight. Okay. So, I, I've already done that. Okay. Point four is forty percent. That's right. Uh, okay, you guys done with the table? Uh, I'm not questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, the numbers look good. One second. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are done with your numbers, right? We're only going to the process. Anna, you need a little help here? <laughs> Well, let's do you and me. Oh, no, no, no. Usually, that's how I just do what I do. So, uh, so grab your cover measure. And so, for this first discount, we're just going to
That's how you can talk to me when you get a phone. You said how you shoot that way down.
So for tonight, you've got this food for thought exercise, which I think some of you have done already, but so the food for thought, you're going to compare name brand stuff with generic brand stuff. So line by line, you're going to literally a 10 pound bag of potatoes. Uh, now you, you can go physically to Walmart or Price Chopper and actually do this. Uh, you can find some online stuff too, whatever works for you, but uh, cola, toothpaste, all down the road. You're going to take actual shopping items, name brand price, generic price, and then you're going to look at the total amount of savings, and then there's some questions for you. And one of the questions just to, uh, is going to get you going on stuff. We're going to do the rest of the term with uh, how much money have you invested the difference of the savings? Like how rich would you be if you just did that? Now, I'm not advising that you eat generic food the rest of your life, but it's just kind of to open your eyes that some of that stuff is kind of cool. Um, and then I want you to watch the last video section. So video section, and I have that on here too, so it'll show up on your calendars. Watch video section number four of this chapter, and we'll see you tomorrow. So you guys keep working. Still a few minutes. We've got five minutes left to class. So you guys are fine. Continue to work on. But if you're done, you can come turn those in.